sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. Taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My placed our faith and trust in Christ and Christ alone, that we, he, we are his forever, or he is ours forever. If we can say it that way, we're part of that family. A great uh, song to remember and to rest our hearts in. Some announcements for today. Uh, first announcement is, finally, Pastor Doug and Amy are in their house. <laughs> Amy is shedding tears over here. Yes, finally. <clears throat> we helped to get all those boxes and all that furniture in yesterday, and it was, uh, it was feeling good, I think, to be all put together. Also, rumor has it that in answer to our prayers, Bev is coming home this week. Is that what I understand? Tuesday. Tuesday. So keep praying that everything keeps going well, and uh, we're looking forward to soon, hopefully soon, she'll be here with us and joining us on a Sunday morning. 
Some other announcements that we have this morning, uh, right after the service, obviously we have some refreshments out there for those of you who are uh, regular attenders. Join us for some refreshments. And then in the Sunday school room, the chapel, or the side room, whatever you want to call it, we will continue the Sunday school lesson on the book of James. We've had some really good discussion in there, and uh, we're going to resume that study uh, today. This coming Tuesday, 6.30, will be the ladies' Bible study meeting here upstairs in the side room, and uh, it is on chapter 5, I think. My wife keeps telling me, and I keep forgetting, chapter 5, something about hope, but I, anyway, it, he restores my soul, thank you. I should have her do the announcements. Oh, okay. Thursday, uh, all of our ministries will be going on, adults upstairs, teens next door at his place, and the children will be downstairs. Had a good uh, turnout last week, a couple of visitors uh, downstairs for the children, and I think you had one visitor, one visitor uh, over next door. So would you continue to pray? Uh, it's gonna, as those children come and are part of the ministry, they're the ones who are going to be talking about what's happening and inviting their friends. And it's friends inviting friends inviting friends. And so uh, continue to be praying about that situation. Uh, sa- Saturday morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, is the men's breakfast. So men, if you have a calendar, put it on there. We'd love to have you come and join us. Usually a great time of food. I should say it's always a great time of food and fellowship, and so we would uh, enjoy having you join us for that. Uh, coming up is our semi-annual business meeting, October 19th. That's a Wednesday. A Wednesday evening, we'll meet at about 6 o'clock, have our fellowship meal together so we can spend some time together uh, casually, and then we'll move into our business meeting at about 645 so make sure that's on your calendar, if you would, please. I've already mentioned that we have some refreshments on the side over here. We'd enjoy, enjoy having you join us for some refreshments and an opportunity to get together, uh, even if only briefly, and then join us for Sunday school. This morning's uh, passage uh, is, a, again, a, another passage of Scripture that I think is in, encouraging to us. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. A great verse and passage about our hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we can call you Father. We know that you are a great, merciful, and glorious, majestic God. You are greater than we can even imagine. And we thank you that you have seen fit to work in each of our lives. You desire to build into our lives through your word, through your Holy Spirit, that we might mature, that we might be a a part of that uh, hope, that salvation that will be revealed in the end times. Father, we thank you that we have your word, that we can study it, we can read it. I pray, Father, that we would not just study, not only read, but we would take the principles, the commands, and play them out, live them out in our lives, affecting others around about us. May our lives be an impact that uh, ripples out and points others to the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the opportunity we have of gathering here together freely in a comfortable building, able to open up your word without fear. And we thank you for that opportunity. And we realize that there are others around this world who do not have that opportunity. And we pray that we would be with those individuals, help them be courageous and steadfast in coming to your word, studying, and seeking to build their relationship uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, to you. We thank you for our missionaries who are scattered around the world who have even this this day proclaimed the gospel. We thank you for the good news that we have from the marshals as they have been able to impact a young life, a young lady who is now studying at at a Bible institute. We thank you for that. We thank you for uh, the effect of her testimony and the testimony of others and, and that they will soon see a baptism that could affect Uh, 20 to 30 uh, family members. We thank you for that. Pray that you would be with them as they minister in this way. May they have a great opportunity to share the gospel 
at that baptism service. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have of being a lighthouse here in Gloversville. And I, I pray that it would not be just our church, but my church and our individuals, us as individuals, sharing the gospel, pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you would continue to guide and direct, protect us from the evil one, provide for our needs financially, physically, spiritually. We pray for those who are set aside with illness and sickness. We just pray that you would be with them and that you would encourage as only you can in their hearts and their lives. For those who are absent, may, you, uh, may they sense your presence and that you would continue to draw them to yourself and they would respond in drawing to you. Father, we thank you for the way in which you have worked in each of our lives. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his death, burial, and resurrection, proclaiming the truth and the only way that we can spend eternity with you. Father, we pray this morning that as we, uh, as we sing, as we fellowship, as we listen to the message this morning that you've given uh, to your messenger, that we would be more than just hearers of the word, that we would take it and, again, do it, that we would, again, magnify you in a great and proper way. We thank you for the opportunity we have and ask your blessing on this day and in our coming week. In Christ's name, amen. You may remain seated, and those who are involved in junior church, ages 4 through 11, you can be dismissed while we sing, and uh, join in as we sing together. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope and without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Jesus Christ, 
faces in here as normal, but that's okay. Hopefully everybody is well. Um, you can pray for the congregation. There's just several people that are, are still sick, uh, are not doing so good. My, uh, my son's one of those. He's running a fever, so if you could just pray for, pray for Zeke. Um, Madeline seems fine, but uh, she seems a little under the weather, but um, they're doing okay. <clears throat> Probably has to do with the move and stuff, but uh, thank you everyone that came out uh, and uh, helped us move yesterday. Also, uh, thank you for all those that prayed and brought cookies or coffee. That was helpful as well. Although I have a lot of leftovers now sitting in my house. If anybody wants to come over and eat some cookies or brownies, that'd be good. Because I'll eat them if you don't. Um, anyway, we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 34. Now starting in verse 11. Before we get into God's word, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time. Father, we ask as we now look into your word that you would reveal yourself to us, Father, that you would show us uh, ever more so what your will is for us, um, that we would accomplish it here on this earth, Father God. Uh, we thank you for this time that you've given to us to gather together, to fellowship, to pray, to read your word as one body. We ask that you continue to, to use us and grow us uh, through uh, your will, Father God, through the measures which you have set before us uh, to follow along with. And so we just thank you, we praise you, we give this time to you. May it be honorable and glorifying to you and to you alone. Uh, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 34, starting in verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock, when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, I will bind up the injured, I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice, and I will set up over them one shepherd. Sorry, skipping to verse 23. I will, I, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. He shall feed them, he shall feed them, and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord. I have spoken. And so uh, David's uh, lineage is what Ezekiel's talking about here. And there's a, uh, quite an interesting uh, story to this. Uh, Ezekiel is one of my favorite Old Testament books. It's uh, one of the reasons I named my son Ezekiel, but I, I think Ezekiel is one of the, the greatest prophets. Um, now, all the prophets are great, don't get me wrong, because they're speaking God's word. So I don't know if you really can rank them. But uh, Ezekiel had a boldness at a time that not many had boldness. <clears throat> uh, Christ is not just king of the Jews, right? Uh, Christ is the king of the universe. He is, he is the God, one with God the Father. 
Um, and he is the king, including uh, all the people on the earth. He is the king over them. That doesn't make everyone his children, so to speak, because uh, not everybody believes, not everybody has faith. Uh, but yet he is still the king, right? As the king, he has the job of overseeing. Uh, and he, see, he oversees justice that needs to take place. Um, justice that's done throughout the world. Um, and he sees the injustice, which is the darker side of that. And so he sees all the justice and the injustice. He has to listen and hear complaints of literally millions of people, those that are his subjects and those that are not. As subjects of the kingdom of God, though, as Christians, living in this wasteland of sin, we are also uh, appreciated by our king. And we are here for his purposes, for his plan, uh, and understanding that as his subjects, he's going to take care of us. That he's, he's looking to bring us unto himself. Um, when there is no leadership or no good leadership, it doesn't matter how good the people are, bad things are likely to occur, right, With, under poor leadership. However, a good leader is able to take a group of people that is nothing and make them into something. Our king, Christ, does that very thing for us, for you, for me. That is the main focus of God's promise to the Israelites in Ezekiel, in today's text. Um, interesting thing that's going on uh, during this period of time is that there was a remnant left in Israel. They were in Judah. Um, this was during the Babylonian captivity. So all the Israelites were removed from Babylon, or removed from Israel living in Babylon. Ezekiel was given a, um, a prophecy, or he was given words from God to speak to both the remaining people in Israel and the people in Babylon. A lot of it was uh, the, Israel people, the Israelites in Babylon. A lot of times uh, the message was for both because the beginning of Ezekiel is all doom and gloom and how terrible the Israelites are. But then you get towards the end of Ezekiel and Ezekiel's like, hey, God's going to bring you back. Uh, right? There's a good at the end of this. But <clears throat> the first thing that Ezekiel... Uh, the first part of Ezekiel 34 is actually Ezekiel yelling at uh, and angry with the leadership that had remained in Israel. Ezekiel 34, verse 1, uh, the word of the Lord came to me, oh, sorry, excuse me. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding your Selves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. And so God uh, is angry with the leadership of Israel. They were only concerned with pleasuring themselves. They were not concerned with the people of God. So uh, the leadership of Israel had been given a task. They had been given things that they were supposed to do according to God's will, according to his plan, as the leadership. And they had utterly failed. And the only thing that they could do is consider what they, what they wanted and what they needed. And they no longer considered what the people that they were overseeing needed. And because of that, the people were in a fallen state as well. No one in Israel, it seemed, was doing right by God. Right? All following themselves. The leadership is a reflection of the people most of the time. Right? God gives people leadership that they deserve. So if our hearts are not with God, then he'll give you someone with a heart that's not for himself. Right? Leading you down a, a dark path really to bring you back to himself, to show, the, show you the injustice, to show you how evil the world can be without him. And so this is what was happening in Israel, is that you had... Uh, not just the Israelite leaders, but the people were all not obeying, obeying the law that God had set up. So Ezekiel sees this. And Ezekiel is given a word from God. He says, tell the people, tell the leaders what I'm telling you. And so Ezekiel goes to them and tells them, what are you doing? You have been given a task, and you have not done that task whatsoever. The remaining leaders in, in Judah... Uh, literally had no concern with what was going on with the sheep. 
And so there's this, uh, there's this idea that even the remainder, the remaining Israelites will be scattered. So uh, at the uh, Ezekiel 34, 4 through 6, the weak you have strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. I love how God still calls them his sheep. They weren't owned by the leaders in Israel. They were owned by God. The leaders were owned by God as well. And God had put them in a position where they were supposed to be leading the sheep to God in their relationship with God. As they moved towards uh, God, the people would move towards God. Right? You see it time and time again. The kings that were in Israel, <clears throat> when they would rip down the high places and they would command, don't worship foreign gods, the people obeyed. And they didn't. But then you had kings that would set up these high evil places and they would invite in witchcraft, right? divination, evil things. And then the people went along with it. It's interesting that they're called sheep. We look at it from today's standards and say, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a sheep. I would, not in that idea. I would have been like Ezekiel. Unfortunately, we would probably not be. Right? And you can see it in today's society. There's really a few, comparatively, to the majority that do not follow God. Right? There's only a few that do, compared to the majority that don't. Uh, same idea with Hitler, right? You would say, oh, if I were a German back in Hitler's day, I, wouldn't have, I would have been one of the ones supporting the Jews. I wouldn't have gone against, uh, you know, the, I would have gone against the people. I would have gone against Hitler. Sadly, probably not. Because most people aren't in the Word of God. Right? Most of the Israelites, including the leaders, were not in the Word of God. They weren't listening, abiding by the law, looking for God in their everyday lives. That is the big split. That's the reason why we can say, look, that's why I say, Lord, please help me not make poor decisions. Asking Him to lead me and guide me. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I consider myself rather young to be a head pastor of, of a beautiful congregation. It's one of the reasons why I was so adamant about setting up an eldership, right? Because I want other men around me that are going to protect me, push me, and drive me towards God to make me a good leader. The leaders here, none of that was true. They were all individually looking out for themselves, seeing what they could gather, what, how they could puff themselves up, Right? trying to make themselves more wealthy as the people dwindled. So God says he's going to put a stop to it. He says no more. Ezekiel 34, verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding, uh, feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may not be found for them. Remember, it's God's sheep. He's concerned with his sheep. And as a pastor, as the leadership of, uh, whether you're an elder, whether you're a deacon, whether you just serve at the church, understand that you've been given a ministry. And it's an, imp an important ministry. And that in that ministry, we need to do right by not the people. We need to do right by God. And in doing right by God, then we do right by the people. So God sees these evil rulers and he says, no more. And I love how God says, I'm going to rescue my sheep. I'm going to be what they need. And that's exactly what our text talks about. It talks about a good shepherd. Right? A shepherd that's concerned for the flock. The interesting thing is that it's, it's singular. Because there's really only one good shepherd. The word for pastor in the New Testament is the same for elder um, pastor, shepherd, they're all the same. Right? They all mean the same thing. And they're, they're overseers. They're, they're guides, so to speak. And it's always talking about sheep, for the most part. Is that they're, they're feeding, protecting, 
and providing for the sheep that are underneath their care. And God says um, in Ezekiel 34, 11 through 12 again, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. The work that we do for God isn't even our work. It's not what we can do for God, but it's what God is doing in us and through us. So as his sheep and as a shepherd over his flock, I must understand that this is not my work, right? Nor is this a work that you're doing. Anything that you do for the church has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with what Christ has done in your life and through your life so that he would, he would have all the glory, right? all the honor for what has taken place in his church. God says that he's going to gather his sheep. So he is looking to build his church. He's looking back at the Israelites who were supposed to usher in Christ, and they did, but they missed him. And this passage clearly, because at the end when we get to verses 23 and 24, clearly say that God is bringing the Messiah. There is going to be one shepherd. And so the Israelites were looking for this king, this reincarnate David, so to speak. They're looking for him and looking for him. But they completely missed him because they missed the word of God. They had become religious and didn't care about what God wanted Uh, They just wanted to be right in their own eyes. That was the major issue with the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. They just wanted to be right in their own eyes. They weren't actually concerned with the people as much as they should be. Verse 12, as a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep uh, that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Picture that day. It's a day of clouds and thick darkness. It's not easily seen. Gloomy. But then you have the light. You have Christ. You have God saying he's going to reach reach out and gather his sheep once again. So this is Ezekiel saying, leadership, you failed. But don't worry, God is going to make amends in his own way and be what the people need, as he's always been. He's going to show them again, once again, who he is. And why what he says is true. He's going to prove himself, which he has done time and time again. And that should be part of our testimony. That God has proved himself true time and time again. That he is our shepherd. That he does take care of us. That he is the one that sought me before I were to even consider him. He says he will gather his sheep. Gathers his church. He says God will feed his sheep. God takes care of us. He takes care of his people. Now that doesn't mean that we will all live perfect, happy-go-lucky lives. We will have our issues, our problems, right? I mean, Paul clearly says in the New Testament that you can expect trouble. Jesus says, if you love me, the world hates you. So we can expect trouble. But we must understand that while we are here, our God will protect us. And we're only going to be here for as long as God wants us to be anyway. We have a a time stamp, written, declared. You can't extend that, you can't shorten that. It's the allotted time that God has given you to live on this earth. And so while we are here on this earth, if we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, then we should act like it, understanding that God will take care of our needs. Here uh, Ezekiel is talking about physical needs, right? Right? Uh, so to speak. They, they understand it as a physical need. God will take care of us. I will bring them out, uh, verse 13, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture on the mountains. Uh, the mountain heights of Israel uh, shall be grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land on rich pasture. They shall feed on the mountains of Israel. So I love the comparison. You have this dark, gloomy uh, time where the sheep are away from home, away from God. It's dark, it's dreary, but then he compares it with once we're back with God, once we're back home. Now I see sunshine. You're on the hills frolicking through the grass, I don't know, right, the meadows, right, and happy. So you have this gloom and despair without God, 
but yet this perfect uh, uh, place with God. <clears throat> so we must understand that God is going to take care of us if we are his sheep. And the idea of sheep is that they're, they're dumb, right? Uh, I love when Bush says that. He's like, sheep, sheep are stupid. And they are, right? They're, they're, they can't live without themselves. Sheep is one of the greatest proofs for uh, evolution being wrong, is that sheep would never have existed, they can't exist, without people. They can't, right? Uh, they would not have been alive. Zero chance. They can't take care of themselves, right? And so as, as sheep, sometimes that seems insulting to us. But we are to have childlike faith, meaning that whatever God says, we need to believe. And when we try to reason, when we try to say, well, God, how can that be so? Then we're just dragging ourselves away from having that childlike faith and then having true faith in God as a sheep. If God says it, it will come to pass. And so when he says he'll take care of me, he's going to take care of me in the way that he sees that I need to be taken care of. If that means one day he'd take my voice away, that's okay because he's still going to take care of me. If that means one day he would take my family away, that's okay because he's going to take care of me. That's a hard thing to swallow, a hard thing to consider. We don't want to lose a loved one. We don't want to lose our own lives, right? We don't want to lose anything. But we must understand that even if in loss, God is going to take care of us. Nothing shall we fear. And in that, we can... Rest, Ezekiel 15, uh, 34, 15. I myself will be their shepherd, be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring them back, or I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up their injury, or injured, bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. He says he will remove the evil. That's the fat and the strong. He says, I will destroy. Many times we see people in our lives, if the, the fat meant wealthy. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when he's saying fat and the strong, he's saying those in power and those that are well off. He says, I'll destroy them. Right? Because that's not what life is worth living for. And you see it even in the church today that people are striving for wealth. They're striving to be accepted in the world today, right? Especially God's church. Well, how can we make it so people want to walk through our doors? We don't. We go out and tell the truth. And if they come, that's because God did a work in their lives. We are to be the messengers of Christ, going out, giving the gospel message. He does all of the work. He will destroy who, he, who he's going to destroy. The riches of the world will be destroyed. That's what the fat and the strong are. When people think that they are wealthy and that they are strong, God can remove it in an instant. There is no hope in what the world has to offer us today. Exactly as these shepherds over Israel had believed that they were in a good place. Read on. They get destroyed. They get taken care of. And the major reason is because they were not obedient to God. And so there's this expectation, right? He, uh, there's several verses I skipped because he yells at the shepherds again, the, the rulers, but then he goes into what's most important. And what's most important is this servant, right? Uh, the expected shepherd. The shepherd that was going to take care of Israel. Again, it's singular. And so the people were to expect one man, one king, one ruler, instead of multiple rulers over different areas. So uh, Ezekiel 20, or 34, 23, the first half says, I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David. There were multiple leaders that were in Israel. Uh, the kingship had been established, right, for several uh, decades or centuries at this point. David had passed away. David no longer lived. Now, David was the most infamous king in Israel, right? He wasn't the first king. That was Saul. King David was the most infamous. And so to be uh, compared to King David was, was a very big compliment. So God says, and this is, this, so this is an understanding that these Israelites would have. God says that he's going to use his servant David. And I can only imagine that the people think 
that God was going to bring back David. I don't think they do. I don't think that that's what they think. I do think they considered what kind of king David was and what kind of king that they were in need of. See, David was a warring king, right? He was a fighter. Uh, it's one of the reasons that God didn't allow him to build the temple, and Solomon builds it, right? David was always at war. Half the time, he was at war with himself because he was sinning, doing, doing things that he shouldn't. But there is this established kingship, right? So they understand that even underneath the king, though, there's other leadership, right? There's leaders underneath the king that have power and rule and authority, but the way that, it's, that Ezekiel spells this out here is that there's no other authority other than this one king, this David. He says, my servant David. And so clearly, I believe that the Israelites would have known, okay, this means that God is going to bring about a king for Israel, a new king. Uh, following in verses uh, 25 and, and on uh, of, same, of the same chapter, it talks about a new covenant the covenant of peace that God is going to establish with his people. First comes the king, though, and the worship of that king before you can have the covenant. David um, clearly had passed away. So David isn't the, the king that he's, uh, Ezekiel is referring to. But the idea would be that it would be the lineage of David. It would be one of David's sons, right? Grandsons, great-grandsons. Someone from the lineage of David would be this new next ruler that the Israelites needed and wanted. Again, the exile had happened. Most of the Israelites don't live in Israel. There was only a remnant left in Judah, and they're about to be removed, to be scattered again. So there's virtually nobody left. God says that he's going to bring in a ruler that's going to regather all the people. I love it. One shepherd. There's only one God. There's only one true ruler. And that this one ruler is going to feed his sheep. As he, uh, the second half of verse 23 says, And he shall feed them. He shall feed them and, their, uh, and be their shepherd. And so there's no longer shepherds. There will only be one shepherd. Well, that's a mighty task. How could one man rule over so many people? I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of people, if not millions of people. All right? How could one man do that? So, of course, it would have to be a, a, some type of man of majesty. right? Of, of course, he's referring to Jesus Christ, but they don't understand this at this time. So, the Pharisees and Sadducees would have this scripture and understand it. right? Understand that there's going to be a coming king, but they still missed Christ when he came. right? Because when we look at the world, or when we look at scriptures through human eyes, there's very little understanding if any at all. Uh, I love Jordan Peterson. I think he's a, a beautiful-minded man. Uh, some people argue and say that he is a Christian, and he may be. Uh, he looked, uh, he's, he's read through the scriptures, and he, uh, he's, a, he's a, a wonderful psychologist. And he sees the importance of the scriptures, and he's not even a Christian himself. Uh, if you look up his, uh, he, he does a series on uh, Genesis. It's amazing. And it's all worldly perspective. And it bothers me because he still misses the point, which is Jesus Christ. They miss the point. And so Ezekiel says, there's coming a Messiah. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees would have this understanding. There's coming a Messiah. They missed him because they were looking for a human Messiah and one that would accomplish what they thought David was, a warring king. But what was the big thing that David did? I think this is more important. David unified the kingdom, really under one king. Now, yes, Saul, Saul did that, but not everyone was for Saul, right? Because Saul was this evil man, right? David goes out, fights Goliath, and then when he comes back from war, they're singing David's praise and Saul's praise. And David is, is greater, and Saul gets jealous, right? So the people were split. When David is king, there's no argument on who's king. There's no, no argument in the land of who the greatest man in the kingdom is. And that's this idea, is that there's one Messiah coming who's going to be great. 
who's going to do great things. He's going to protect and feed the sheep of God. He's going to give them rest. He's going to give them a peace that surpasses all understanding. Yet when Christ comes, they're expecting a warring king. So he says he's going to feed the sheep and he's going to be a prince among them, showing that he will be a king. Right? Uh, verse 24, And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. What God says will come to pass. What he speaks is always true. And so when he says this will happen, this will take place, we can have faith that it's going to take place. And it did, right? This is all pointing to Jesus Christ. It's one of the greatest things about the Old Testament is that it's always pointing to Jesus. The Old Testament has everything to do with the coming of Christ. The New Testament is all about how Christ has come, and everything past that is how Christ is working in and through his church today. It's all about Christ. All of life is about Christ. We are so easily distracted, and this is exactly what happened to the sheep, to the shepherds in Israel, is they have become easily distracted their kingdom had been removed. All of Israel, the majority of Israel, is now in Babylon. So what would the rulers and the remaining people there try to do? Try to probably rebuild the kingdom. But why was the kingdom taken away from them to begin with? Because their focus was not on God. It wasn't on His glory, on His honor. Their lives, they had not separated for the working of Christ, or for God at this point, but they had... They had this will of their own to accomplish their own tasks, trying uh, to make themselves look good in the eyes of people. One of the, uh, the greatest downfalls that a lot of the kings had in Israel, the evil ones, is they wanted to be like all the other kingdoms. Look at me, look what I've done, look at what I've accomplished. And so they set up the high places of worship, the idols, so outside nations would look at them and say, oh, hey, wow, look at them. And instead, what they do, the outside nations, God used to destroy Israel time and time again. Why, as people of God, would we want to be like the world? The world that clearly says hates Christ and hates us because we love Christ. We have a, prin a prince, a God, a king among us, royalty, that has chosen us and wants to use us, that is drawing us to himself, that he would give us a peace that surpasses all understanding, that he's going to provide our needs no matter what. And yet so easily distracted we become with what the world says, hey, look at this. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Now, I, I say that in, as, as we've just moved to a house more than what I've asked for. I asked the Lord for a house that I would be able to raise my children in, that would be convenient to live at, uh, that would be close to the church. I don't know if I could get much closer. Right? The Lord is very good, very good to me. Right? But even if you were to take it all away, my family, my house, you, God is still good. God is still king. God is still working in the lives and through the lives of his people. And when we deny the power of God, when we deny what God is doing, then we just go to live in the world. And then the world eats us, chews us up, spits us out. Because it hates us. Don't abide by the world. Don't be, these, don't be the shepherds that forsook what God had called them to do. The greatest leaders of all time are the greatest servants. Christ was the greatest leader of all time because he was the greatest servant by far. No comparison. He came and served, and through his servanthood, he was a leader. It was interesting. Um, Sarah and, uh, Sarah's mom passed away last week. And so yesterday, uh, there was a funeral. So in between moving, um, I went to the, the funeral. Sarah had asked me if I would... Uh, if I would do the opening and closing prayer, absolutely. Um, and so there was several testimonies uh, about uh, Cecilia, what's her name, Cecilia. Every testimony, 
about her had to do with what uh, one Christ is all about Jesus and how she served. She served others. She always considered others before she considered herself. One of my favorites was uh, uh, Carol Allen. You guys know Carol. Um, Carol uh, was having a real bad day. Her house was a mess. Her life seemed to be in shambles. Cecilia shows up at the door, unannounced, knocks on the door, and Carol got all upset. She's like, oh, no, she's going to see my house. She's going to think I'm a slob, think I'm terrible, right? And so uh, Carol opens the door, and uh, Cecilia says, are you okay? She goes, no, I'm awful. This is, everything's terrible. She puts down her purse, walks into the house, and starts doing the dishes. And then she helps clean the bathrooms, and then she makes the beds. She cleaned her house, didn't say anything, picked up her purse, and left. She served. Everything, everything was servant, servant, servant. And, and not, not to say that they missed what the point was, but I got up and at the end I said, how she even held my daughter in her weakened state. She held uh, uh, Madeline. And everybody was mad at me for letting her hold because she, tr- she had been falling at this point. She had been tripping, you know. Um, and so lack of balance or whatever. But when she grabbed my baby, there was no, the, she had hel- held so many babies in her life. She naturally just hugged that, hugged my little girl. And I felt she's perfectly safe in those arms. There's nothing going to happen to her. Sarah came running over, what are you, crazy? And took the baby, right? Uh, took Madeline back. But she loved, and she loved children. And I truly believe it's because of the way that Christ had affected her life. And because of how much uh, she loved her Lord. And so all these people that are giving testimonies of how they would want to be like her, you're missing the foundation for why she was like that. That was Jesus Christ. If you want to be great in the eyes of people, you need to be a servant, right? All these people that are puffed up on them by themselves, that can sing well or they can play a sport well, they're terrible. Most of them, I shouldn't say all of them, most of them are terrible people because all, all they do is consider themselves. The greatest people that have ever lived, by far the greatest servants, those seeking to serve others. Be great servants. And in that, then we can be great shepherds. The shepherds had forgotten they were the servants of the Lord. Let us not forget that we are his servants first and foremost. And in our servanthood is when he is made great and then God can use us when his name is glorified, when his name is honored. We are nothing. He is everything. Right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much um, for Ezekiel and for his book. Thank you for uh, the boldness that Ezekiel had to go forth uh, to the people uh, and tell them your word, tell them the truth. Thank you, Father God, that you have called us and chosen us, that you want to use us, Father God, as your body, as your church. We ask, Father God, that you would reign and rule in our lives that we would truly seek to honor you and glorify you with our actions, our, uh, our thoughts, our intentions, um, that we wouldn't look to just uh, live out this life well in the eyes of the world, but we would look to live out this life well for your will. Um, I pray that we would desire, Father God, uh, those words that when we were to arrive uh, and stand before you, stand before your throne, that you would say to us, good, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. I pray that that would be the desire of each person's heart here today, Father God, that we would look to do your will, that you would cause uh, good servants, Father. Help us to be servants, Lord, in the way that you've created us to be. For each one of us is created differently, Father. So teach us and show us your will for us individually and then show us your will as your body, as one church, For you have decided to use the body, to use the church as your mechanism for the gospel, to spread the gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. So let us be that gospel machine, Father God, going uh, across Gloversville, spreading the good news, and on through Fulton Montgomery County, through New York and through our country, that we would actually uh, seek the change through your power, through your will, uh, that your name would be glorified. For that is when... uh, uh, Our country was the greatest, was when your name was proclaimed the most. 
Help us to get back there, Father God. We love you. We thank you. Continue to use this church that you've provided for and that you shepherd for so many years. Continue to do so, Father God. Help us to seek you uh, through your word, through prayer, and through fellowship, that we would be your people doing your will. We thank you. We praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.